alaikum and very good afternoon we are expecting few more audience in a moment therefore we will begin the event within next 5 minutes please be patient for a while and please uh, mute your mic uh, during the event so that everyone uh, listen the, this event very carefully Respected ladies and gentlemen, it's Madrasa Zafar, President Association of International Students, Society Pakistan Chapter 2021, and the moderator for this event. To start every work, it is essential to pray in the beginning, and for this, I would like to request Engineer Ghulam Mustafa Abro 
community peacemaker for Association of International Student Society Pakistan chapter and event head of our society. Uh, I would like to request him please recite few verses of few chronic verses. Auz billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Ar-Rahmanir Rahim. Maliki yawmiddin. Iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in. Ihdin siratal mustaqim. Siratal lazina an'amta 'alaihim. Ghairil maghdubi 'alaihim waladdallin. Translation. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. All praise belongs to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. The gracious, the merciful, master of the day of judgment. Thee alone do we worship and thee alone do we improve for help. Guide us in the right path. The path of those on whom thou hast bestowed thy blessings. Those who have not incurred thy displeasure and those who have not gone astray. Sadaqallahul Ali Lazim. Jazakallah. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, I welcome everyone on behalf of entire Pakistani community at the University Technology Patronas. Association of International Student Society, Pakistani chapter, personally believe to support undergraduate, postgraduate student in terms of their studies research and fun financial constraints to prevail inter-community peace. In focusing the research part, part, today we have invited one of the animated scholar who is none of other but our own associate professor, Dr. Ibrahima Fai. Let me introduce him in a formal way. He is attached to the Department of Fundamental and Applied Sciences, University Technology Patronas, and is currently leading the science of learning group under the Center for Intelligent Signal and Imagining Research, CISER, a national center of excellence. His research interests include machine learning, mathematics, signal and image processing, science of learning. He has published over 150 papers in peer-reviewed journals and international conference and also holds two patents in image processing. He is a senior member of the IEEE and currently the chair of IEEE Computational Intelligence Society, CIS Malaysia. Doctor, the floor is yours. You can start by sharing your screen. All right, thank you, Mr. Uh, Munda, sir. Okay, can you see my? My screen. <clears throat> yes. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you for all the attendees. And um, as mentioned, so here we have talked about uh, how to write good research proposal for master and PhD. Uh, but I will show later on the content because I guess a few of the participants have already done the research proposal. So because of that, I have included a few slides regarding articles, research articles about the publication, as well uh, a few words about uh, dissertations of, or, or, of Viva, Viva Bose, for example, for Master of PhD. All right. So after the introduction, I will talk about research proposal. So I will go into uh, different elements of research proposal. For example, how to choose the research topic. Okay? What should be the motivation or what should be the points to consider before you go into a, a certain direction for research? How about the literature review? How do, we, how do we deal with the literature review? What are the key points that need to be considered and how a literature review should be, uh, should be done? Then we move to the pollen statement. Okay. So again, we just look at the main points about uh, each of these, these items that hopefully would be useful. Uh, the research objectives. Okay. So this is a kind of uh, different uh, steps 
and the order here is very important. Then the scope of the study, okay, when we have our objectives, how do we set the scope of the study? And what are the key elements regarding research methodology? So these points actually, some of them are for research proposal, but definitely they would be valid as well when you are talking about research articles or you are talking about your thesis. Okay? So the points that we have here could be used in different ways. But then for research articles, I will look into two main points. Okay? As I mentioned, the previous points would be valid for research articles, but I will add here one point about contributions. How do we deal about the contributions in a research article? And then, this is very common, how do we respond to reviewers' comments? Okay. It's very rare, I don't know what is the percentage, to send a journal uh, article and it is automatically accepted. Definitely, we usually get um, feedbacks from the reviewers. And it's extremely important to know how to respond to these, to these uh, comments. And the last part, I just took a bit about uh, dissertation or thesis. And for this one as well, I will just pick up two points because over here, I did not include about results and discussions because this is about research proposal. I will mention a few things about it later. But I included here about results and discussions regarding dissertation and thesis and about novelty, which is a very common point that is uh, highlighted during Viva or before Viva as well. And I will just give at the end some remarks okay, about um, all the things that we have discussed and some of the elements that I did not include over here, but just to, to touch about them. Now, let's start with, uh, first of all, why do we need a research proposal? Okay, and what is it exactly? So we could define it as a formal document where actually we have, that I put in, in bold, a few uh, questions that need to be answered. For example, what a research intends to do, to work on, and why? Because we cannot just wake up one morning and decide to go for one direction. There should be some reason behind. Okay? So we have the what, what we want to do, why we want to do it, what is the motivation behind, and lastly, how we want to do it. So what are the plans um, of, for, for doing this? Okay? So of course, this could be for UG research. We have some like um, small projects or small research that is done in a group, for example. Of course, it could be done even before, uh, before UG, before university, the university. You can have some research uh, at a lower level. Okay? But let's say over here we concentrate from UG and, and above. Then, of course, we have master's, PhD research. And there's one element that we tend to forget or think that it is only for the already well-established uh, researchers, but it could be interesting as well for the students about grant applications because while you are learning you are in your master or phd journey you will have to somehow learn about this grant application so that later on when you are an established researcher it will be easier somehow to work on uh, writing a proposal so all these things could be uh, the target when we set or, or when we work on a research proposal of course when you have a poor or inadequate research proposal, so what could happen is definitely for UG will say that you will have a poor evaluation. For master's PhD, we have all these re, re RPD, re RCS, reviver, and so on. Now, it's not definitely a sign of failure. I, just want, I need to highlight it from here because it happens sometimes that uh, some students are asked to do re representation of the research proposal, and they take it very badly. But actually, as I usually mentioned to some of the students, is that it's better to repeat the RPD than going for repetition of the VIVA, because this is uh, a bit more challenging, and same thing for re -RCS. So that means if you are not able at the first time to, to convince the panel about what you are go going to do, it's fine to work out on it, to work it, uh, to work it out, to make it better, before going for a journey of PhD and having problems later, uh, for example, at the time of the Viva. Okay? So whenever these things happen, we have to look at the, the, the positive point of view. That means you are making it better and you are making sure that everything is right at this level, then towards the end, there will be no, no big issue. 
And of course, for grant application, well, what will happen is that's just the rejection. Okay? And this could be an, an issue if you keep getting rejections, that means no funding, no funding, then difficult to have um, proper research. Because uh, as we all know, we need money to do research in general. Okay, so that was about the introduction. Now let's look at the different elements that we have in a research proposal. Some of the elements that I have highlighted over here, of course, you could have uh, more than that, but let's just focus on, on these elements. The first one is about how do we choose the research topic? There are too many, too many directions of research. What are the criteria that we could consider before deciding to go into a certain direction? Now, the first point that I have here is about it should be a very active research area. Okay? That means there's some research is ongoing. It's not like a dead branch of a tree. Okay? It's, it's ongoing. And you have prolific publications in this area. That means people are publishing. You can look at the, the, this year, the year before, and the, year, the, the years before, you still have publications, a lot of publications in that different directions, but still in a given, in a given uh, area of, of research. So this is something that needs to be considered. If you have an area which is uh, inactive, if nothing, nothing is happening, there is no way to go into it. Okay? That most, of, most probably you will not find a lot of things to do out of it. So this is the first criteria probably I would mention that is important to consider. The second point that needs to be considered, that could be considered, Okay, would be the impactful. So what is the impact of, of the research that you are going to do? It could be something that have a big impact on the society, big impact on environment, on health, on well-being, and so on. So that means there's a need to work on this research. Okay? So of course, these, uh, these, ten, these items that I mentioned over here, they will be overlapping between them. Okay? So if it is uh, impactful, probably people will work on it, so it will be an active, or it could be the other way around. But this is something as well that need to be, uh, that could be included in when you set your criteria for deciding about a research topic or the area in which you want to, to work on. And the third one is uh, what usually we, we hear, uh, this is a hot topic. Okay? So what it means is just, let's say you have a new technology, something just Someone found something, some, someone find, let's say, one approach, a new approach, a new technology, and it, it opens doors for a lot of, public, a lot of uh, research and eventually a lot of, uh, lot of publications. Okay? So this is a, a hot topic. And of course, again, it could be something related to the previous one. So it could be because it has a lot of impact. For example, suddenly you decide to work on uh, there's this COVID research or research related to, to COVID. So this is definitely something which is, which is new and uh, which is needed. So it have uh, a huge impact on, for example, health and so on. And you may have some problems that suddenly appear. It could be, uh, as I mentioned about the example of COVID, it could be something else that people need, did not realize before. And suddenly you see that there's a need, a huge need uh, to have a solution. Then it becomes hard because people will jump into it and try to find a solution. Okay. So these are some criteria that could be considered with, when we um, think about, about research. Now you may ask, where, where do we find this or how do we, uh, how do we decide uh, about these, these points? <clears throat> there are some signs. For example, if I go for in the literature review or just in the literature in the particular field, I could see the publications. Okay? I could see what is happening in terms of the conferences um, regarding this, this research area. Okay? And could be as well just in terms of, of discussions. Okay? Uh, especially nowadays everything was almost uh, online. But before that, when you have the, the chance to meet some people in a conference, sometimes in small discussions you can get ideas about uh, what is needed in this area. Because you may not find everything written in papers. But you find, you meet, for example, uh, one of the top guys in the area, and you manage to have discussion in, uh, during a conference, or uh, for example, at a tea break. 
So this will somehow give an idea that, yes, this is something uh, very active and people are working on it and could be very interesting to work on it. We have the potential applications. So I write here real and potential applications. The real applications is something that already started and people are already applying it. But beside this, you could have something relatively new, not yet applied, but you can see that there is a huge potential of application. Then it could be interesting. Okay, this is what could be the motivation to go into this direction because now it's not yet applied, but we see there's a big potential of applications uh, in the near future. And of course, uh, we could talk about uh, high citations. And this is somehow related to a hot topic. Sometimes even you just look at the number of citations of a paper. You see a paper published, for example, 2020. And after just a few months, you can see a huge number of, of citations. So that, that will tell you that this is something that is attracting uh, many people. So many people are working in this, in this area. So this could be a, a sign. If you see a one area, you have one publication, even by the top guy or one of the top guys, and you see the citations after a few years still very low. So that means maybe the interest is not, is not there. Okay? Or maybe the number of people that are interested in this area is not, is not that, 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 that big, and uh, maybe there's no, no big needs in this, in this area. So this could be some, some ways of checking uh, about the three criteria that I mentioned uh, earlier. And I added over here about the diversity of feature work statements. So when you look at a research paper, at the end of the paper, usually we write about what we are going to do next. Okay? The authors will mention about what they are planning to do next, what is the feature work. Now, here what I mentioned here, diversity, what it means is that if I take an area, I look, a few I look at a few papers, and all of them are mentioning in future work about the same thing. So that means this area, I will have less chances to do something because there are already too many people and they are all planning to do the same thing in the next maybe two, three or five years. Okay? So in that case, especially if you are new and they have been there for a while, you don't have any chance to beat them. By the time you get into this research, they will, be, uh, they will have done what they mentioned they're going to do. So what I mentioned here about diversity is mean, if I look at different papers, some authors will say, okay, the next step I will go for direction A. And another author will say, I will do B. Another one will say, I, need, I, will, I will do next, I will see. So this shows that there are too many things that could be done in this area. So that is very important. That means if I just look at a few papers, I want to see what they are planning to do next. So that could give me an idea about how rich is this research area, and how are the um, different possibilities? Okay. So that could be a one, one way of, uh, of deciding as well uh, about the, uh, the direction. Now, once we have all this, we check all these criteria and we find, let's say, a few research topics okay, that um, satisfy, let's say, the criteria that we set. Okay. Of course, we could have some other criteria, but let's say you manage to have a few, a few topics. There's something is extremely important, but this one will, I will say it depends on the school of thought. People will think differently about it. But to me, it's something extremely important, is that once I have everything is done, am I really interested in this topic? Okay. I have done a short list of topics. Let's say I have done two or three topics. Now I need to check, do I want to spend, for example, for PhD, three or four years working on this area? Am I really interested? So the other school of thought will say, well, it doesn't really matter. You have something you can go into in, the interest will come later. Uh, to me, there's still a risk. Okay? So that's why I just put this, uh, this chart here. That means you have a few criteria, a few uh, things to check. At the end, you have to ask yourself this question, do I really want to work on this area? Am, am I really interested in this area? To me, if no, it's better to go back and work out maybe some other 
uh, some other topic. And if yes, then you are done. You know what is the topic in which you want to work, and then you can you can proceed on. All right. So next is about the literature review. Okay. So going into uh, the literature review, what could be interesting is that to make a kind of uh, clustering of the papers. Okay. So you will have, for example, a group of papers going into one direction. So you need to look into the overall picture of this direction and then some other groups of papers going in other direction. So it's good just to avoid going into um, too many directions. So you, you, you may need to have a grouping or let's say clustering um, of, the, of the papers. For example, you would do, them by, do it by categories. This is just an example. You say, okay, I will look at papers that have used a parametric method or non-parametric method. So I'll split it into two. Okay. So, then I will have two clusters for this particular case. And we could look at uh, by different approaches. Some have, let's say, the traditional approach, which has been there for, let's say, many years. And then, for example, from 2020 or 2015, there was a new approach, and people are publishing in this area. So I will split it in two groups, and I will check into these uh, differently. So this is a, a kind of systematic way of uh, making groups and looking at the groups uh, because this will be helpful later on when you want to get the overall output from these papers for this group of papers and so on. So that's why we have this kind of uh, diagram. Okay. So let's say I'm focusing on one approach. I just call it approach A. But then when you go into this approach A, you will see some papers that go into approach A1 which is a kind of uh, sub-branch, and you have approach A2. And from this approach A1, you will have two, some other uh, branches going from this uh, approach A1. So this would be very useful, especially when you, do a, you are doing a literature review, to capture each paper will fall into one of these, these branches. So that will be helpful later on when you do a kind of uh, synthesis of, your, uh, of the output that you could get out of, this, out of these papers. Now, what is uh, interesting or, or important to consider is about who are the authors, the year, of course, of publication, uh, the journal, where it was published. Okay, We know that these journals have some, some, some ranking, and the year will give you an idea about, well, when, it, when was it done, what happened after this. Okay, What has been done? That means, what was the method that is used in the paper? So that's important. Which method has been used? Or say before before that, what has been done is you are just talking about what was the, the direction in this paper, okay? or what were the objective of this paper. Okay. So after the objective, how they have done it. So which method was implemented in a particular paper? What was the experimental design? What were the data that they have used? Okay. So all these elements are important and to be uh, useful later on when you want, for example, to do a kind of summary of, of the results of the literature review. Okay. So what were the evaluation parameters? So, in, so this is in general, of course, depending on the area of applications, but I think the core would be, would be valid for, for almost everyone. That means once you have some results, you need to evaluate the result. This is very common. You have to evaluate the result. You have probably to compare with existing literature. So what were the parameters that were used for doing these evaluations? Okay. Because this parameter could be different from researcher to researcher. So it's good to know exactly what was done in a particular paper. And some of the points that we tend to forget when we do literature review, which are very important, is what was the achievement? It's not just about describing, okay, what was there, what they have done, what is the method, and so on. What was the achievement? That means, for example, if you are talking about uh, one parameter, what were the achievements for this particular parameter? Okay. So this is very useful, and this will, again, uh, could be used later on uh, when you do a summary of, 
your findings from the literature. And I put here in bold, this is about the advantages and limitations of, of the methods. So it could be sometimes challenging to have this for each paper, but if you cannot do it for one, each paper, at least you could have one section making for talking about, for example, the advantages of a group of papers, as I had uh, shown before, if you have this, these groupings, I could say, for example, what are the advantages of using approach A11? Okay, what are the advantages? What are the drawbacks? I could do this for each of them. If I cannot do it for each paper, I will do it for groups of papers. Okay, and it is good sometimes, not sometimes, actually in general, to have a summary of, of the literature review. So you are making, for example, a table where you want to summarize. You may not have to write all the papers, uh, to, to write all the papers there, but the most significant papers you could have them there, or you could do it by grouping, as I had shown before. And then in this table, you will mention about the advantages and the drawbacks, and you, you can give uh, some input at your, at your level, and or some inputs coming from the authors themselves. Sometimes the authors themselves, they will mention about the advantages or the limitations of their methods. Okay? Of course, this could be uh, checked because people could sometimes do uh, overclaiming, but there's a, at least an idea about what they think about their work. If themselves, they mention the limitations, so this could be uh, something that to consider. Uh, for, for later uh, investigations. So I just want to highlight here a few examples to show here some examples. Okay, this was just, um, I just extracted from, from, from a paper okay, that I was reviewing. So Scholars of 54 has introduced two techniques with the first employing uh, chi-square statistics and mutual information, and then full stop. That's it. So we know that sometimes if you are doing, for example, for a research paper, you will have some uh, constraints in terms of the, the space. Okay? But definitely, to me, this is not a good one because we don't know a lot about this paper. We just know that, okay, they have used uh, chi-square, mutual information. Okay, what are the data sets they have used? What were the limitations? What are the techniques they have employed? Nothing is there. So it's not, not that informative. And unfortunately, these kind of things happen. This one maybe is an uh, extreme case because just one sentence. But I will show another one. We have a few more sentences, but actually still, it's not uh, good enough. So what is mentioned here, the authors analyze different abnormalities in brain using MRI images. Okay, so we know which kind of images they are talking about. They have used these parameters, six different parameters. Okay, and that's it. For this paper, 63, the, the review will stop at here, okay? And then the author will go to the next paper, which is uh, 64. So again, this is not good enough. We don't have a lot of information about what has been done, what are the techniques, what, are the, what, was the, uh, what were the, the outputs, and even if we cannot add the advantages and limitations, at least what were the achievements? What were the methods that, that, that have been used? So these things need to be there. Otherwise, it's just like you are talking a story and, well, we just, uh, we just mention it. But it's not really useful for the reader. If, for example, you want to go for uh, next steps in this direction, for example. Now, be, of course, definitely it will take more, time, more, more space if you want to go uh, into more details. But here, what I could mention is just about uh, the points that I mentioned. Okay. So it's an example, okay, the 126 proposed a new structured super, super vector machine. So we talk about the method. They utilize 164 normal and 300. So we know which data set they are using and the data set, the name of the data set is given. Okay. What are the techniques they have employed? Okay. What they have done, let's say pre-processing, what they have employed in terms of methods, they mentioned all. The classification results, what were the results? It is given in terms of, for example, here we have the accuracy and you have the area under the curve. So 
we know about at least the data set, what are the techniques, what were the output. Okay? Although it, it, doesn't, we do, uh, it doesn't include about the advantages and limitations, but as I mentioned, this could be done for a group of papers, so that we don't have to do it for each paper. So this could be the way that could be considered in terms of doing literature review. We need to think about someone who will be reading this, who is, for example, not necessarily in this, in this area, but want to have an idea about what has been done. So the details should be there, what has been done and what were the achievements, the techniques, and so on. Now, from the literature review, okay, when we do limitations and, uh, for example, if you are not able to do it by each paper, as I mentioned, is it done by group of papers, then we have to look at how do we write the, the gap, what is, what is really missing in this area. Okay? So, for example, I will notice that for a few papers, there is one limitation, for example, uh, limitation one. Okay? This limitation is observed in a few papers. Then I will have another limitation two, again, that is coming from a few, a few papers. I will have this maybe more than, more than two. I will have a few limitations. Okay? And from there, I need to formalize what is really missing in this area of research. Or what are the gaps? What is what need to be done? So that is uh, what you could summarize in in a paragraph: the current gaps. So one way of seeing it is what is the desired result compared to what has been obtained so far. Okay, in this particular uh, research area. So people want to have something, want to reach a certain level, but then. When I look at the literature, I could see if I do a combination of all what has been published, there's still a gap between what is desired and what is currently obtained. So that will justify to do a research. That will give the justification for you to go for a research in this area because you see and you show that there is a gap and this gap needs to be filled. All right, now from this, we can move to the next step. That means now I know what is uh, missing in, the, uh, in a given area. I have to formulate the problem. So what is the problem statement? Okay, so from the gap analysis, we have to formulate the, the research problem. Now, we, it could have different, different forms. It could be the desired results not yet obtained. Okay, so for example, if we are talking about uh, accuracy. Now, people want to reach, for example, 95% because of the application in this particular area. The desired accuracy is 95%, but currently the highest accuracy obtained is 90%. It's just an example. Okay? But that shows that there's a gap between what we want to achieve in this area and what is achieved so far in a particular, uh, from, the, from the existing literature. Then you may have as well to deal with unreliable methods. Okay. For example, uh, subjective measurement. Again, this one depends on the research areas. In some research areas, there is no issue. In some research areas, this is an issue because the subjective means I ask uh, different doctors to give an assessment. Okay. Doctor, uh, Dr. A will give the assessment for one particular problem. Dr. B would be another, will give another assessment. So there will be some differences between uh, the assessments given by the doctor, by the doctors. And you could have even the same doctor giving assessments at different times or different time of the day of the same problem and the assessment could be different. So in that case, that means we have something uh, very subjective and which may not be useful for the next step. Okay? So that be, could be something uh, to, to fix. Unvalidated or weakly validated, what I call, call here weakly validated means I have excellent results, but I have done it in a very simple, a very a simple or very small uh, data, data set. Okay, so the result, although they show, um, for example, in terms of accuracy, very high accuracy, but then it's not fully val validated because it is validated on, um, for example, a data set which is too small 
doesn't represent all possibilities, and so on. So in that case, there's still a gap. That means even if you are going to reproduce the same work, if you are showing that it could be validated in a larger, uh, at a larger scale, that could be something which would be um, an, an, an uh, added value to the, to the research community. Conflicting results, that could be a problem. So you have a group of researchers, they conclude, conclusion of this is A is bigger than B. Okay, just an example. And other groups say, no, actually A is less than B. So that means there is a, a, um, a conflict in terms of the results. They, they do not match. Now you want to come up with one research, some experiment, experimental design, some methodology, said that you will be able to see out of these two directions which one should be the right conclusion. So if you are able to make something uh, that is acceptable, that could convince everyone that actually this should be the conclusion for this particular research. So that will be uh, that will be have, uh, having that will give some impact on this on this research. So these are some problems that could exist um, that could exist in in research. Uh, one more here is about unpractical methods. Well, it's like um, the method that you propose or the method that have been proposed in the literature are extremely expensive. That means real life application are not possible because too expensive. Okay, so that means this is the problem. So you could try to come out with a result later on that could be uh, cheaper and that will be uh, a solution for, for this issue. And in some cases it may happen, you have an open problem. So far, no one was able to give a solution to this problem and you are brave enough, you think you can go it, you can, you can go for it, then, then that could be uh, a problem statement to consider. Now, what is very important over here is that when you go through the limitations, this of, again, this is, um, this is an opinion, you may have different opinions, I mean researchers may have different opinions, but when you finish the literature review, you will have a lot of, uh, you may have, you may see a lot of limitation, a lot of gaps. Okay. Now, when you move from the gaps to the problem statement, the thing is that in your problem statement, there is no point to write a bigger problems that you are not going to attack or to solve later on. Okay. So out of all the gaps, I will see the gaps that are somehow reasonable for going, for example, if I'm going for PhD or for master, which gap I would be able to address. So these are the gaps that need to be mentioned in the problem statement. Okay? Because we will see that there's a link once you are getting uh, from the problem statement, then the next will be how do you set your objectives. Now, some issues Okay. Related to what I mentioned just now, it could be too broad. So you not, need to be careful that you are not setting problems to solve everything in this area. Okay, so that will be uh, too ambitious, and you not have the, the ways to have to set a research objective to address these problems in a reasonable uh, timing, if I could say. So this is something to consider. And sometimes, but this is more about in terms of, of writing. Okay? Sometimes we talk about this problem statement, but without setting it as, as the problem itself. Of the common issues, okay, one of them here, when you say no one used approach X, this is a very common mistake. To say, okay, uh, in this area, people use method A, B, and C. No one has tried method D, and you write it as a problem, but actually it's not a problem. The problem is not the fact, because if people don't feel that method D will give the result that is desired, then they don't go into it. So you, would, you could mention later on that you want to investigate method D, and we, we talk about it later on, because you feel that it will give the solutions, then that's fine. But still, you don't have to write it here as a problem. If one area has not been explored, it's not a problem by itself. The problem could be 
the result obtained so far by using method A, B, and C are not satisfactory. Okay? They are not reaching the level that is expected. So that's the problem. If people do not use a particular method, that's not a problem. Okay? So this is one of the common um, mistakes. And sometimes, this is for example, uh, you mentioned about a, a few problems, and then therefore this research aims to study and blah, 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 you continue in this. But then when, whenever you say, therefore the research aims to study, you are not talking any, about problems anymore. Now you are talking about what you are going to do. And this is not supposed to be here in this section of problem statement. Problem statement, just talk about the problem. How you are going to solve it, that will come later. Okay, so this is a common mistake as well that we tend sometimes maybe uh, over the, I wouldn't say the excitement, but we, 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 we are somehow um, in hurry to mention how we are going to solve it. So this needs to be really separated between the problem. We just mentioned what are the problems that we are trying to, uh, to solve. And later on, we talk about what are the solutions or the ways that we want to solve it, to, we want to use. And the same thing goes for the third example. Uh, when we say we want to apply method Y, because we think that method Y will solve the problem, this should be written somewhere else later on. Okay, we talk about it, but it should not be in the problem statements because in the problem statements, just need to mention what are the problems. All right, so then if we have, we will come back to it. Actually, this is, to me, this is one of the, uh, the most important parts, a very clear problem statement. We know exactly what we want to solve. Okay. The rest actually will come, uh, especially the next one about the research objectives. It's just, we know the problem and we try to find a way to solve it. Okay. So based on the list that I have shown just now in terms of uh, problem statements, the research objectives will go into the same directions. Again, this is not showing all possibilities, but just some of the uh, possible ways of uh, writing or in terms of how do we set the objective or what could be the research objectives. Okay, so for example, we want to develop a method to achieve at right here between market or get closer desired result because that is, that is as well um, a good objective. If you are not able to reach what is desired, but you are able to achieve more than what has been published so far, then that, that is good enough because you are getting closer to the result. Okay, so sometimes while writing this kind of objective, you need to set the standards. The state of the art, this is what they have achieved. My method, I want to achieve this number in terms, for example, of if you have some parameters. So that will show that you are trying to get something higher than what exists, even if you are not able to get to um, what is desired in this area. Reliable method, okay, as I mentioned, if there are some methods that are not really reliable based on different reasons, then your objective could be, well, I want to, to develop a method that is reliable. Of course, there will be a way, a criteria for judging it is reliable or not. Okay. If the methods in this area are not, or let's say the results are not really validated or the validated validation framework is not good enough, okay, it's not acceptable, then you could work on developing a method and proposing a validation framework that could uh, somehow uh, show better that, than what has been published so far. I mentioned earlier about the conflicting results. So if you are able to set as an objective to solve this issue, okay, you will come out with a method that will be acceptable to everyone and that will give what could be the final output and um, uh, in terms of, um, will it be from group A in terms of researchers or group B of researchers, you know, or let's say group A or group B of conclusions. And then the practical method, as I mentioned, if you have some method that, well, it just remains in the lab, okay? People have done it in very expensive labs and uh, I mean very, very rich lab, and they're able to show some good results, but then practically it's not possible to implement in real life. And you come out with, you, you have your objective to work on a method that will be practical, 
for example, by reducing the cost or showing that this could be implemented uh, compared to what is um, shown, what has been shown theoretically, for example. And the last one is, well, we have a problem, very clear problem, and so far there's no solution uh, in it. Then we work on this, uh, finding a solution to, uh, to solve this, uh, a solution of this problem. So you can see the research objectives are very much aligned with the problem statements. That, that means if the problems are very clear, then going through the objectives some, somehow would be, uh, would be easy because I just need to see which problem I have and how I want to solve it. That will be my objective. Okay? Uh, I mean, object, setting the objective will be just to address the given problems. Now, a few points to consider. The significance, appropriateness level, okay, I put these together of uh, the objective. Okay? You have prob some problems, you set the objective, and then you need, you need to look at a few points. About the achievability, so can I really achieve this? The skills, do I have the skills, or am I ready to get these skills to, to do this, uh, this uh, to, to go for these objectives? What is the cost if I want to do this? Um, do I have the, mean, the means of doing it? The time needed, if I say, well, I have a very good objective for my PhD, but I think it will take me 10 years. So then, no point. You have to think about uh, the duration as well. Okay, do I have the support that is needed? Supervisor, supervisors, collaborators, and so on. So, and the last one is about the constraints in data collection. I will just mention maybe just one slide for each of these, uh, just a few words about these, these points that are extremely important and that could be considered as well in, in, in a loop. That means I have my objectives and then I look at this criteria. If there's any point that is happening as an, as an issue, then I need to make a loop and go back. Do I need to change or to modify the objective that I have? I have said. Okay. Now, the significance appropriateness. Here I just wrote, for example, if you are going for a master or a PhD, of course, we cannot talk about objectives that are just like what I call here FYP. Okay. It should not be just like an improved final year project. If I see that if I go for this, this objective, what I will reach at the end is not good enough to be a PhD or a master, then I should not go for it because I will have some issues later on. Okay, so this is something, uh, something to consider. Uh, one remark over here that sometimes people fall into these mistakes. Challenges in data acquisition do not justify upgrading. So what I mean by here is that if, for example, I have some objectives, and to achieve this, I will have to do some experiments that are really painful. Okay, I have to collect data under the very hot sun. I have to go into the mountain to get some, some data. Yes, this is challenging. But that doesn't tell you that because it's very difficult to get this data, so my work should be PhD. No, no, it doesn't work like that. Unfortunately, people sometimes think like that. But this is not the case. So you have to set something uh, which is appropriate in terms of the level or in terms, in terms of the significance. And this is regardless of what you are going to do later on. I mean, how you are going to do it. Okay? If the added value is at the FYP level, it doesn't matter how tough it is to get the data that doesn't give you the upgrade to PhD. Achievability, of course, when you set we should not be too, I mean, over ambitious, if I could say. So that's why I have here no PhD plus plus. You cannot set the like going to the moon. Um, no, we have. If at the end you are able to get something which is really high level PhD, then that's good. But at the time of setting it, we cannot set it too high. And you should be able to convince about the achievability. Now, this is sometimes what you feel when you are sitting in an RPD and it's like, okay, when I finish my PhD, there will be an Eiffel Tower in Toronto. Hmm. 
So I really have to believe this. So it's just about what you think you can achieve. But of course, it has to be reasonable. You cannot set it too high. Okay. So this is, um, of course, these things are not coming alone from the, the student. Of course, you have to go into discussions with your supervisors or and so on. But it has to be something that you can convince people that this could be done in a reasonable time, for example, the time of a PhD or a master's. The skills, do I have all that is needed? Do I have the skills? So when you answer here no, it's not really a problem. As long as you are willing to acquire the, 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 the skills that you need. And sometimes what happens is that when you start your, your research, you are not really sure about all the skills that you need. So this is why it's very important to be ready, at least mentally, that along the way, if I need a skill, I have to acquire it. I cannot say, oh, no, this is, I am in biology and this is statistics. Oh, I really cannot. No, no, no. You need it, you just go and grab it. You don't need to be an expert in it, but you need to get um, the basics that you need for your research. And that's it. And you can just move on. Okay? So this is a mindset that's very important that I don't have the skills. Any skill I need for my research, I will acquire it. Okay? I have to acquire it to be able to move on. The cost of your research, well, if you go in, a, in an area where the experiments will be extremely expensive, and if your supervisors are broken, they don't have a broken, I could say, they don't have any fund that could uh, that can fund this, this research, or the university is not able to provide what is needed, so there's no point to go into it because that will give uh, troubles towards the end. Okay, not even towards the end. At the moment of you need where you need this research, uh, the, your experiments, you are not, not able to buy the chemicals or to, to buy whatever you need, then it will be a big issue. So if you could anticipate, then you have to think about these things uh, before moving on. The time needed, as I mentioned. Of course, we can set very nice objectives, okay? set a lot of things, but then if this will take me ages to do, or I will be really in trouble uh, running after the time, or the time running, time running after me, then it will be an issue. Okay? Of course, again, this is something that needs to be um, discussed with supervisors to see what could be um, achievable, because sometimes we don't have the, the experience, but at least the discussions, we could we could foresee what could what could happen in terms of of timing. Do I have the support that is needed? Now, I word that would my SV, my supervisors, my collaborators, my parents, my brothers, sisters, cousins, friends, my pets, all of them, can they help me in this research? You say no, 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 and you still want to go it, then that's fine. But at least you know that you will be alone and you will have to find out. So you should not, you know, go into it and later on realize that I'm alone doing it, then you should not complain to your supervisor or the others. So this is very important. So you go in the research, okay, you are really interested in it. Can your supervisors provide some help? Maybe no, maybe yes. If you are sure it's no, collaborators, where well, I just put the others, but the idea is that I need to think about where I could get a support. It's not they are going to do the research, but at least, you know, someone with whom, with whom you could discuss could give you some ideas, uh, some advices, and that will help you to move on. So this is something to, to, uh, to really consider. Okay? I will talk about this towards the end, but it's very important because sometimes, um, for example, we, we need the funding, okay? We find uh, a researcher who, who, who is a researcher who is willing to fund our, our work, our PhD, okay? So he has the money, but then you go for a topic that you are sure that you will not get help at all, support, advice, nothing. So it, we have to be very, very clear. That means if I really want to go ahead with this, I need to know that I have to do it by my own. Okay. Or at least maybe I will get support from others, but I cannot expect something 
for my supervisors. So we just have to be very honest and, and see how it is. And I added here one about the constraints in data collection. So here, I'm not talking about the financial aspect of the data collection. Okay, so that one, let's say we already talked about it. But I'm talking about in some research areas, you need ethics approval. It's not like, okay, I just set an ex experiment, I can just run it. Okay, I just call the students and, 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 and collect data from them. There are some, some uh, ethics approval that could be needed. Okay, so this needs to be checked at the beginning. Otherwise, later on, at the time of data collection, it will be an issue. So do I have to get ethics approval? And if yes, how long it takes? Okay, if there's no point, if I have to, to wait for one year to get the ethics approval, and some of them could be, um, could, could take a lot of time. So these are things that need to be considered before you embark in a certain uh, set of objectives. All right, next one is about the scope of study. So let's say, clear about the policy statement, your objectives are clear, then it's good to know what are uh, the frameworks, or let's say the boundaries, okay? This is probably something that uh, brings sometimes confusion about the, the scope of, of study. So it is just actually setting the boundaries, that means this is the framework of my study, I have, these are the limitations, I'm working in this particular domain or this, uh, this particular limitations. So it should not be written as research objective or research methodology. Okay, they are totally different things, but unfortunately this is uh, something that happens. So this is just an example. Okay, I just made up example. For example, I would look at the impact of chemicals on uh, river fishes. Okay, I need to consider the chemicals, which, consider, which chemicals need to be considered because I cannot study all of them. Which type of fish I'm, I'm looking at? Which rivers? What are the rivers that I'm, I want to consider? Okay. The sample size of, of each species that I'm going to collect. So which type of impact? Okay. And for example, which parameters I would like to, uh, to consider? So that will give you a kind of framework because otherwise it is, it is too wide. Okay. So when you set your, your scope of study, that means your results are valid in this framework. So this is why it is important to set at the beginning, because otherwise it is too open. You, you obtain results from a particular or specific framework. You cannot claim it for, for all. Okay. Have here some examples. Um, this is from a PhD uh, 2002 in, in Japan. So this study is mainly concerned with the microscopic pedestrian traffic characteristics from both the simulation and the real world data. So you are setting what are the limitations. So here you are looking at, uh, the author is looking at simulation and real data. Okay, so the system were developed in the study consider only pedestrians. So you are mentioning clearly, here you are just talking about pedestrians, for example. Okay, you are not talking about, uh, sorry, in two-dimensional, not talking about three-dimensional or four-dimensional and so on. And over here, for example, it's clearly mentioned what is excluded. Okay? This could be as well written in the, in the scope of study. You are saying what you are considering, and you could mention what you are not including <coughs> in your research. Okay? Like the last sentence as well, mixed traffic between pedestrian and vehicular traffic is not examined uh, either. Okay? It's relatively short, and it just mentioned what are the limitations, or let's say the framework or the boundaries for this, for this research. Another example, okay, so talking about, for example, the data collection, the real data will be subject from uh, HVSM. Over here, this could be more precise because the idea of mentioning here the hospital is that you want to mention about the, the device they, are, they have there. So you could just mention, for example, uh, the type of device they are using so that your research is valid in this particular case. <coughs> okay, some details about the experiment, how data will be collected, which kind of software will be used, okay, and then uh, what are the, the ways of comparing with existing methods. 
Okay, talking about uh, performance metrics could even as well give the details which performance metrics you want to use. So that will make it very clear. This is what I want to do. These are the type of data I'm considering. And these are the parameters I want to use in terms of evaluation. So my result will be valid in this particular case. So just an, an example of something uh, that is not uh, good enough as in terms of uh, scope of study. This research can be categorized into three parts. So this one is more like you are describing what you're going to do. Okay, the first part investigates and so on. The second focuses on studying the group profiling. Okay, so that may, may be good, but then the second part focusing on developing a novel. So it's just more of a descri description of what you are going to do. But the scope should be more than that. You need to really give the constraints or the limit, the boundaries of your of your research. That means what you are considering and what you are not considering uh, to make it clear. All right, then we go to the research methodology. <clears throat> now, when we go for research methodology, the first point that um, could be considered that which methods are you planning to use? Okay, and I put here in bold the why. Most of the time, we forget to mention or we don't mention about the why. If, for example, there are hundreds of methods, if I'm going to use or to investigate uh, 10 of them, what is the justification of these 10? There should be some reasoning behind. It's not something, oh, I just choose these 10 because the names are nice. No. There should be some reasoning based on the problem that I have to solve, based on what have been used in the literature. I feel that these, and I feel should be something justified, okay? Based on the application in some other, um, some other areas, for example, some justification on at least some ideas of, of the choice, how you made the choice, need to be there. So that's very, very important. It cannot be like, okay, I just pick up randomly some of them, I just implement and see how. No, the justification needs to be there. Then for the methodology, of course, what is important as well is what kind of data need to be collected. Okay, for this particular objective, if I want to reach uh, this output, for example, which kind of data do I need and how I'm going to collect it? So sometimes uh, we need, depending on the, on the areas, we need even like the, uh, the design, the experimental design. You want to design exactly how you are going to collect the data because if there's something wrong in it, then what you are trying to get may not be there. How the data will be collected, so the conditions uh, and so on how the data will be analyzed and interpreted. So this could be maybe not in details, but could be there in terms of um, to achieve what you want to achieve, how you will check the data that you obtain. So what are, for example, the parameters that you have to, uh, to use to be able to justify a conclusion? Okay. And how the result will be validated? Because let's say you have some uh, new type of data. What is, for example, your ground proof? Depending on uh, which area on which you are working, you may need to see what are the ways of validating. Okay, that is very important because the validation is not, is not there, then uh, you, cannot, you cannot claim uh, the conclusions. And of course, this will be always there. Whenever you get some results, you need to check how do you compare your results with the existing methods. Okay, so the state of the art uh, methods, how you are going to compare your result, what are the criteria that are acceptable in terms of comparison to be able to make conclusion or make a claim, for example, that your results are better than the result of the others. All right, so. These are the points that I have considered for regarding the research proposal. As I mentioned, some of these, or maybe all of them, could be useful in research article as well as in uh, uh, thesis, when you are writing uh, thesis. All right.
Okay, so just to touch a few points regarding uh, research articles. One of them is the contribution. Okay, now there are two actually two very important points that sometimes we, we overlook is when we write an, a paper, it's very good that we mention clearly what is the objective. Because unfortunately, sometimes um, it's not that clear what we are going to solve. And we can sometimes get the feedback from the reviewer that we don't really know what are the objectives. So it needs to be very clear. Okay? So as, as mentioned uh, earlier, so we have a literature review, you have uh, a policy statement, or let's say the, the gap in this area, and from there, you set your objectives. So it needs to be very clear. And then the contributions. So sometimes when you, when you write, people will go through the paper, and at the end, the question will be there. We don't really see the contribution, contribution of the paper. I'm not talking about what thesis, just the research paper itself. To avoid this, it's good to make it very clear. These are the contributions, and we can see it, um, at least in some areas, that people systematically are going to, toward that direction, writing exactly at the end of the introduction or the related, related work, what is the, the contribution of this, um, of this paper. This is just to avoid uh, confusions of the reviewer. Okay? And I will talk later on about this, because sometimes the reviewer is not 100% in the area. So to make it easy for him to see, it's better to write it clearly. These are the contributions. And of course, you have to be uh, written in a certain way and written based on what has been done. So you can mention what has been done and what you are going to do and what are the differences so that you can anticipate this, this question from the reviewers. Okay, so at the end, for example, of your introduction or let's say related work, so based on the drawbacks of existing methods or existing studies, okay, you mentioned that uh, blah, blah, your method is developed. So that is not enough to say the method that you develop. Then you could add a few points to mention what exactly is the contribution of this work. Okay. So of course you should not, uh, I will go back to this later on, but you have just to go to the main points so that is very clear from the, the reader to see what is the contribution of the paper uh, based on what has been published in this area. Now, of course, you have to make sure that what you are claiming as contribution is a contribution. Okay? If the reviewer feels that you are fooling him, then you may get the rejection uh, quickly. So it has to be very clear. Okay? And some of the points, uh, another point that to consider is avoid the careful or careful use of for the first time. So sometimes we, we like to write this. For the first time in the research, this method blah, blah, blah has been done. Can you make sure that it is really the first time? Now people are publishing everywhere. So I, in general, it's better to be careful. Okay? Sometimes you add this sentence like, uh, to the best of our knowledge, maybe that one could be acceptable. But not write something very formal to say that no one ever in this world has done this. Okay? This is just to be, to be cautious about, about this issue. If you, you write something, and it happens that the reviewer has done some work on this, then that's it. And the last point is about uh, overclaiming. You have to be careful. We should not uh, overclaim. If you have a research paper and you are claiming you have about six, seven contributions, mm, it, will, it will be a bit, uh, a bit fishy. So you have to be careful. I would say even it's better to underclaim than overclaim. Okay? You underclaim, maybe the reviewer could see actually you have more than what you have seen. So that could be a good thing. If you overclaim, then the trust will not be there. Okay, uh, next point regarding research articles is about, usually we get uh, comments from the reviewers and then we want to see um, how do we answer these comments. So what I have written here is that the reviewer is at least temporary, he's the boss. So this is in French, I'm not really sure how to translate it, but the idea is that when you, you rag your, your pet, you have to do it in the right direction, okay? So you have to 
make sure that you don't confront, or at least you have to do it in a very diplomatic way when you when you answer the the reviewer. Okay. And the idea is that you put the boss in the corner, said that his only option would be to say accept. So he will open a lot of things. This one you haven't done, this one you haven't done very well. You need to be able to answer each of them in a way that he will not go back to it. So that at the end, he's in the corner. He cannot say, no, 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 actually I forgot to mention. No, whatever he mentioned in his review, you already answered clearly, then he, don't have he doesn't have any other cho choice. Okay, so fill up any single bridge opened by the reviewer. So that's the objective. Not try to go into uh, great uh, arguments and no, whatever he opened, try to convince him about what you have done. So then he doesn't have any, any other option. Now, quickly about just three scenarios. <clears throat> so the first one is, um, let's say, easy. The reviewer requests changes that are valid and doable. Well, you just do them. And in the answer, sometimes we forget to uh, highlight this. You need to mention exactly where in the manuscript you have done the changes. Okay, they have depend depending on the journals, they have different format, but definitely it's very important to answer the question and mention where the changes have been made. So that makes life easy for the for the review. The second scenario, the review requests changes that are valid but not doable. So not doable means it will take a lot of time to do, or it is beyond the scope. Okay. In that case, you don't do the work, but then you cannot just say, uh, no, I cannot do it, and that's it. Or you cannot give like very uh, not convincing uh, reason. Okay. So you have to explain exactly why you think that what you have done so far is good enough, and that his suggestion is a very good suggestion, but you will take it for the next uh, for your future work, okay? But you have to, to answer in a way that he is convinced that whatever you have written so far still have a good contribution and the next could be done in future work. And the last one, which is a bit more critical. So the reviewer says something, but you really don't agree with him. Maybe he's not in the area. Maybe he give a point that is really not valid from your point of view. Okay, so you haven't done the, the changes, but you cannot mention like, no, what you are mentioning is wrong. Not, not that way. You have to, to convince him that uh, what you have done is the right way, even if you need to add some more references to justify or to back up what you are, uh, your position, but it has to be done in a diplomatic way. So you still have to, you know, to rock the, the pet in the right direction. All right, um, just a few words, so the time is, is running, so let me just try to finish this part about a few comments about um, the thesis, okay, uh, all the points somehow mentioned earlier, I believe could be applicable for in terms of literature review, objective and so on, so that is about the same, but here I just want to mention about uh, results and discussions. Okay, tables and figures shall be self-explanatory. So if you write your thesis and when people open it, they look at one figure and the figure doesn't say anything to them, or they have to ask you, the panel has to ask you to explain, that means something is wrong. The figures or the tables should be self-explanatory. That means it's a very condensed or let's say a summarized set of, of, of results that people could understand. Okay, in terms of uh, what, 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 what the data is showing and what are the, uh, the parameters that you consider. In terms of labeling, everything needs to be very clear. So that is something very important to consider. Uh, I go a bit faster about discussions. Okay, what are the meanings of the obtained results? What are the possible explanations? Uh, do the results match or not the expected expectations or the hypothesis? What are the possible conclusions? So here it's not necessarily something you are very sure for man. So it's fine if sometimes you get results, okay? You are not really sure, but very important is at least to try to give an explanation or to set a possible set of explanations, of conclusions, okay? So this is very important to, to consider. 
and then of course we need to uh, to be able to compare uh, with what whatever has been uh, published. Uh, some issues exp expansion on the details of the result without discussion. So sometimes in discussions we tend to repeat the the results by giving more details, but that doesn't help. Okay, we need really to um, to get to get the, the the discussion based on on the results. And some issues as well are conclusions that are not showed by the results. So we get some conclusion, but actually it's not coming from your, your data. The data doesn't show that, but you just, you wanted to get that, but actually it's not there. And of course we have as well this issue of uh, over claiming conclusions. Uh, it's like your research doesn't have any limitations. So that is usually something uh, a bit fishy. Okay, so this one, I call it novelty, but we could, Others as well consider as contributions, but this is something very common as well in in uh, dissertation or thesis or in a, in a viral session. People want to see your contributions, and this is where I will relate this to objectives and going back to the problem statements. Which means if your problem statements are very clear, okay, from the literature review, then you should not have any problem with the novelty because you can mention. Uh, what you have achieved based on what you have said earlier as problem statement and then as objectives. Okay, so this point is actually just a repeat of what was there in terms of the objectives or in terms of the problem statements. And just to finish this part, I will talk about a few remarks. I didn't mention about proposal defense, I didn't mention about preliminary results. In some departments or maybe some units, they ask about preliminary results. So it's not necessarily to be there because we cannot expect to get results at let's say three or six months of, of research, depending on the area. But what is important is sometimes just to show that you manage to have some hands on what you are going to do. A small experiment, okay, just to, to touch the things. See, okay, this, what I'm going to do something similar in a, in a bigger scale, but now I just want to make sure that you know I, I have the basic, the basics, and could be even just repeating or uh, redoing something that already published, just to make, for example, if it is one of the state of the art results, if you are able to implement it, then it's a good start because later on when you want to compare with your result, it will be easier. A few words about references. So this remarks is just going into different directions, okay? Just touching some points that were not mentioned. Uh, in the presentation. Now, there's no excuse to not have something updated in your references. That like being for, for Viva, be, uh, for PhD, being for master, for proposal defense, your reference needs to be updated. So usually one advice I give to myself and to the students is that it's very good weekly, if you cannot at least monthly, to check by keywords in some of the data, databases to look at the most recent papers that have been published. This is a very good exercise, so that will help you to be aware of what is happening. And in terms of writing, uh, we hear many times students blaming and not Mendeley. This is not acceptable. These are just tools that are supposed to help you. Okay? If something goes wrong, don't blame them. That means you didn't check the details. Okay? So this is a, just a remark because it's something very common. English language, definitely a big issue <clears throat> in terms of writing papers. If you have excellent results, you cannot present them in a way that people could understand it, that will be an issue. So sometimes it may be expensive. If you have the means, it's better to pay. If you think that your level doesn't help you to, to show exactly what you have done or what you have achieved in your research, it's, it's good to invest. I will call it invest in, in a good uh, proofread of your of what you have done. Plagiarism, definitely this is a big issue. Just to avoid this issue, sometimes it's better to, uh, if I could say, overcut than not 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 uh, giving uh, enough uh, references in terms of whatever you write. You have to make it sure if it is not coming from you, you have to make sure that you capture the source of what you have written. Okay. So this is something like uh, a no-no because now it's somehow relatively easy to find. So we don't want to take any risk about this. 
Uh, quickly about supervisors, supervisory relationship. Okay. Uh, just this is one is something very critical as well sometimes. If everything goes fine, you still have to work on your independence. How do you learn how to be independent in research? How to get initiative? Don't just expect everything coming from the supervisor. Okay. And sometimes just go and find some things and present to your supervisor. That will show that you are taking initiative to look into other directions. And of course, you need to be convincing, even with your supervisor. If he asks you to go one direction and you think it should be the other direction, you have to discuss and make it sure, convince your supervisor that what you are saying is, is the right direction. If something goes wrong, of course, you need somehow anticipation. Anticipation, what I mean by that is that before you start your research, you definitely need to look at the profile of your supervisor. Will he be able, for example, to assist in some, some areas? If not, and you still accept to go, then if later on there's some issue, you have to be uh, you know, accountable of what is happening. Try to understand, and if there's something wrong, we need to look at the, uh, the policies and so on. Okay, just want to give some time for uh, Q&A. So this is how it looks like research emotions, what I could say. Uh, this is this is a journey where you a journey where you could have all these emotions or some of them depending on uh, depending on the area depending on the people but you could expect you know things will go up and downs and if you are ready to to go from it I mean you you have it in your mind at the beginning then definitely you'll be able to handle it if you do not expect this then it could be uh, it could be challenging so you need to be prepared that it will not be always uh, pink, so sometimes it is different colors and something that needs to be handled. And thank you so much for for attending. I think that's all what I have to share. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, it was a very nice session. Uh, before uh, going for a QA session, I would like to announce that, uh, dear audience, please uh, fill the attendance mark for each certificate and later on for recording of the session. I repeat, please uh, mark your attendance, and the link is given in chat corner. Now I want to uh, open the floor for question answer. If someone has some queries, they, he or she will open his mic and video cam and ask question with our uh, respected guest, Dr. Ibrahim. Assalamu alaikum, Mautala. Uh, Okay, uh, I'm Nazri from Malaysia. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof, for your uh, magnificent sharing. So I, I, I got two questions. Okay. Uh, the first is uh, um, on the literature review part. Uh, okay. Is it everything that we put in our method need to be discussed and need to be uh, critics need to be uh, what they call uh, uh, displayed in our literature review. Right. And second question is uh, in, uh, regarding the references. Okay. okay. Uh, if I want to cite one paper, okay. then I read, I I go to that paper, then I I see that that paper cited from another paper. Yes. So uh, do I need to go? Uh, deeper to the original source of the paper, or is is this uh, is it just enough for me to to cite the first paper just now? All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, uh, Nazri. Okay. So uh, regarding the first question, regarding the uh, about the literature review. Okay. So you had mentioned about um, if you want to. Uh, do we have to go into the details for each each paper, for example, that we have uh, we have cited? So by right, it should be the, that that way. Of course, could be time consuming in terms of writing, or let's say space consuming if we are talking about writing. But for example, we cannot um, expect to have to mention a paper with some details, but then that's it. We don't go into the details. So we need to find out what, as I was showing earlier, what has been done in this paper, 
and what had been achieved. Now, if we have, in terms of grouping, if you have a few papers that falling in one category, so if I cannot do it paper-wise, I could do it for the whole group of, of papers that dealing in, for example, uh, one particular approach. So I could give an over, overview of uh, what have been achieved using this method and what, um, what were the limitations, for example. So if possible, better go into each detail, but if not possible, at least when we do the grouping of the papers, then we could give the, analyze, uh, the analysis for each of the, uh, the subgroups. The second question about the, the, source, the source when we look at a reference. So we get, go, this is very common actually, we go to the paper and the paper will give us reference, some other references and it could be something like endless. Now, uh, I think this one will depend on what we are going to extract from the paper. So if it is some information that we just need to, uh, to mention it, for example, Sometimes we just need to mention that, okay, um, this direction has been checked by some papers, so we mention those papers. Even if that paper is taken from another one, as long as I'm not planning to go into the details for this one, I don't need to go to the, uh, to the others, other references, if I could say. Okay? The main references, main reference that I, I use to mention that uh, they, have, they have done it, then that's it. I could just stop it there. But if it is something very critical or very close to my area of research, okay, that means I need to dig more. I cannot stop at the first paper because that first paper may not give the details. So from that first paper, I get some other references. I need to go to those references to get more details. So especially if it is something very close to what I'm doing and I need to describe exactly how, how the, the authors have done it, the I could, could call it the, the paper on the surface may not be enough. I need to go to the others to see how are the steps uh, or what are the steps they have followed and what are the, the, the details of the description for the method they have used, because that could be useful later on uh, for my research. I hope that answered the question. Okay, doctor, there is a one more question in chat corner. Uh, okay. Uh, from our community peacemaker, Mr. Ram Swabro. Okay. Uh, he asked that, is this, is this necessary that we must develop our hypothesis and methodology based on only journal papers and more specifically based on Q1 papers only? Okay. Um, Q1 paper, let me start with that. Uh, not necessarily because we could have actually this is something very um, subject dependent. I mean, depending on the areas. In some areas, even conference papers are highly uh, um, valuable. Uh, high, high, they have, have um, top level in terms of um, how people respect these, these papers. So in that case, it's not even a, a, a Q1 paper, but still, for example, some areas in uh, in, in image processing, for example, it could be just a conference paper for medical images. Some conference papers are even, uh, in terms of weight from the, from the community, will have higher weight compared to some journals. So not necessarily Q1 papers. Now, develop our hypothesis and methodology based on only journals. Yeah. So I think that that's, that's the thing. Depending on the area, it could be, as I mentioned, not even journals. If you have very good conferences, then in some areas that is that is acceptable enough to, to work on, on it. Uh, I hope that answered the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. If uh, okay. anyone else has some question, he or she just open his or her mic uh, and ask question. Uh, I think there's one question um, in the okay. chat. Make sure it's a contribution. Is there any difference between contribution for a paper versus for our PhD. Um, okay, uh, let's say for, for the, in terms of the, the level, for example, if I have a contribution at, uh, for a paper, the contribution could be at the level of a master, but still a, a contribution. Okay? So that means for the PhD level, the contribution needs to be at the level. So you could have a good contribution, 
but doesn't justify to sit for, for Viva, for example, because it's not at the level of, of PhD. So it could be still a contribution because uh, you are somehow adding something to the body of knowledge, but what you are adding will have different levels. So you, for PhD, it has to be at the level of PhD. Uh, I hope that answered the question, Ms. Romaisa. Okay, one, one more question for off. Uh, can Prof explain more on hypothesis, how to strengthen it? Okay. From Mr. Abdul Hazim. Okay, so the hypothesis, um, actually when we set the, the objectives, and when we set this, um, a few points that we want to possibly in our methodology, now, when we do this, it's because we are expecting something. We think, for example, by, by using the approach A, we'll be able to solve this problem, uh, problem one, for example. So the hypothesis is that you just need to write exactly, for example, for this particular problem, we hypothesize that using this tool, we'll be able to solve it. So we have a, set, a list of problems, and a list of methods that could be that we have uh, included. So we are mentioning before doing the research that we hypothesize that using this method, for example, I could achieve a higher accuracy. Of course, if you could give some elements of elements why you think that this will work, that will be strengthening your hypothesis. That means it's not something that you just uh, take out of the uh, out of a, a bag, but you have some reasons to believe that this type of method will work for this particular type of, of problems. Then that, that will uh, somehow uh, strengthen your, your hypothesis. Okay, thank you very much, Prof, uh, for question answer. Uh, dear audience, I share the email address of our respected guest, pro Assistant pro Professor Dr. Ibrahim Afai. You can email to him uh, for further question and answer. Now, I would before uh, going for group for two, I would like to invite our community peacemaker and even head Mr. Engineer Hula Mustafa to open your uh, video and share your few words. And also, I would like request to our precious guest, Prof. Uh, Dr. Brahma, to open your video cam. We want to see you. And so, before going for group uh, photo session. All right. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, accepting our uh, our invitation for this particular topic. This is most important and uh, crucial thing for every research student. And uh, on the on the basis of uh, this workshop, you know, uh, I I'm, I'm getting very good uh, feedback. Uh, apart from that, I'm really uh, thankful to uh, the Department of Fundamental and Applied Sciences and more specifically the electrical and electronic engineering department along with uh, IEEE UTP student branch and IEEE robotic and automation society uh, through which we have uh, hit for the maximum audience today we have like more than uh, 80 plus audience from different countries and uh, sooner uh, we will be dispatching the certificates as well as sir with your permission if you allow we can share them the recording as well as the presentation yeah this is uh, I'm really thankful to you, sir, uh, on behalf of our advisor. I must say that Professor Dr. Faiz Ahmed uh, has been encouraging us all the way and uh, with, under the leadership of uh, Mr. Mudasir, who is very dynamic and uh, activist, ac activist student, always encouraged me and uh, encouraged the other members. So uh, hoping that in, in, in future we will have your guidance more about uh, this, these research topics, sir. Thank you so much once again. Okay, thank you. So much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, at the end, before going to group photo, I would like to announce that uh, thanks to everyone uh, because uh, our uh, audience from different countries like Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Indonesia, China, Nigeria, uh, Malaysia, uh, and almost uh, 15 different countries. It's a very good achievement for us, and inshallah, inshallah, uh, we will continue over these. Uh, research events uh, in further in further uh, more uh, uh, months or uh, further time being 
so uh, please turn on your camera uh, i would request to everyone turn on your camera for group photo so that uh, after the group photo we will end our this session i request to everyone please open your cam and for recording uh, you can follow us over your our youtube channel official uh, every uh, our every event has been recorded and its video uploaded in our youtube channel you can also follow our official instagram uh, fa uh, facebook group uh, for getting more uh, event details and for more uh, event uh, informations videos and uh, sessions accordingly for time being okay mr gulam mustafa bro uh, you can take picture Uh, just give me a moment <clears throat> okay so uh, regarding the youtube link i'll i'll share when I, we will be sharing you the certificates we will be sharing you the youtube link for the recording as well so with this i would like to grab the moment and uh, seize the moment with your permission okay uh, in malle we say tiga dua and satu here we go Okay, uh, once again, once again, this is uh, like a uh, freestyle. So I need your thumbs up, huh? Okay, on on count of again three in Malay, we say tiga, dua, and satu. Okay, terima kasih. Thank you, everyone who joined this session, and I got like we go, we are getting good feedback. Thank you so much. Do uh, do not forget to like our page, and uh, the for YouTube link we will again share you soon. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. any any comments from uh, mudas sir your side any comments okay uh, thank you it's uh, it was a very great session if you need any information you can email us uh, we will be there for you and we will entertain you thank you god bless you goodbye thank, thank you, thank you so much. much thank you so much thank you respected prof uh, dr vermo uh, for accepting our offer thank you very much you're most welcome thank you for so, inviting so, me so kind of you, sir so kind of you you're most welcome thank you